Poor Things is the best propaganda movie I've ever seen. It is visually beautiful, it is funny, and it has great acting, the whole package. But at its core, Poor Things remains a film that is not there just to make you laugh or entertain you. It is a film with a heavy ideological message. This will be the topic of this essay. We will analyze the ideological themes of this movie, which I believe can be best described as the triumphant reaffirmation of feminism. The idea to make this essay actually occurred to me when I first watched this film back in December, and since the Oscars are coming up, this is the perfect moment to record this essay, since I predicted it will win quite a few of them, if not outright best film. But beyond just awards, I think that this film represents an important part of our modern ideological discourse. Many, however, believe that movies and other media are just there for entertainment. I disagree. The entertainment that we consume defines our culture and the way that we engage with politics. The perfect example of this is that you cannot explain the politics of the 1960s without rock and roll. So in this spirit, we will try to understand the core ideas of modern feminism through a film that completely embodies them. Before we actually get into the analysis, we will quickly review the story and the main characters. If you have not seen this movie, I really recommend watching it and then returning to this essay. So yeah, let's get on with it. This movie has two main themes that I will concentrate on. The first is the relationship between sexuality and maturity, and the second is the Jungian archetypes of the male characters, and how Bella faces them throughout the movie. This surreal story begins with a suicide. A pregnant woman named Victoria jumps from a bridge. Her still-functioning body is found by Godwin, a mad scientist, who puts the brain of her baby into her body. This operation is a success, and now we meet the protagonist, Bella Baxter, who is a child inside the body of a grown woman and who is discovering the world. Therefore, this film can be best be seen as a surreal coming-of-age story. Bella lives sheltered in Godwin's house, where he raises her in a very cold and scientific way. To help him to register the progress of his experiment, Godwin asks Max, one of his students, to keep an eye on Bella and write everything down. Later, he offers Max Bella's hand in marriage. However, she has great curiosity and wants to see the outside world. Furthermore, this curiosity turns inward towards her own body as she soon discovers sexual pleasure. Meanwhile, Duncan, Godwin's fuckboy lawyer, decides to use Bella's sexual curiosity to convince her to run away with him to Lisbon. Godwin, being the overprotective father, reluctantly decides not to stop her and lets her go, while Max, the weak-willed fiancé, attempts and pathetically fails to stop her. Bella goes to Lisbon, where her childlike sexual curiosity is fulfilled by this experienced womanizer, in several explicit montages. All is well until Bella's curiosity leads her to explore Lisbon, and now Duncan takes over the role of the man attempting to limit Bella's freedom. But this time, the, motiv the motivating factor is jealousy instead of trying to protect Bella, since he, of course, wants her all to himself. As a result, their relationship becomes strained and Duncan brings her to a cruise where she will be easier to control. In this cruise, on route to Alexandria, Bella's curiosity leads her to meet Martha and Harry, who introduce her to reading books. Duncan feels that he is losing her and starts gambling and drinking. In Alexandria, Harry, who is a cynic, shows the suffering of the poor to innocent little Bella. She recoils from this and rebels against Harry's cold apathy by taking off Duncan's money and giving it to the poor. This means that they do not have enough money and therefore they get thrown out of the ship. Duncan and Bella end up broken Paris. Their relationship is beyond repair since Duncan is as jealous as ever and blames Bella for all his misfortunes. Since they have no money, Bella unwittingly gets into prostitution. This is the breaking point for Duncan, and Bella begins to live in the brothel where we get more sex montages. Here, she completely discovers her sexuality, and for the first time, she becomes fully free and independent. Here, we see that she becomes more confident, discovers socialism, fights for the rights of sex workers, and becomes lovers with Toinette, a fellow prostitute. 
In the brothel, she receives a letter from Max telling her that Godwin is terminally ill. Therefore, she returns to London and discovers that she is the product of a brain transplant into her mother's body. This obviously shocks her, but she comes to terms with it and decides to marry Max once more. However, during the ceremony, General Alfred Blessington storms in and objects to the marriage. We find out that he is the husband of Victoria and Bella's father. He comes to reclaim his wife and does not believe this story about brain replacement. Bella then proceeds to absolutely cuck Max for the second time and runs off with the general to his aristocratic mansion. Here, the general terrorizes his servants and attempts to return to a normal aristocratic marital life. But Bella insists that she is not Victoria. She becomes the prisoner of the general and protests against it. The general decides to quell her rebellion by commissioning a doctor to give her the Somalian treatment. He demands that she drink a sedative, but she throws it in his face and he becomes unconscious. Bella runs away from the general's mansion and brings the unconscious general with her. Once she arrives at Godwin's house, they reconcile as Godwin is dying, and she says that she desires to become a surgeon as well. Finally, Max is told to perform the same brain transplant with the general's body and the brain of a goat. In the final scene of the film, we see Bella girl bossing with Twinnet by her side as Max brings them both martinis. The general, meanwhile, is eating grass on all fours. And so ends Bella's character arc from innocent child to triumphant woman. Bella's process of growth from being a clueless girl to a strong independent woman is marked by her rebellion against the men who try to constrain her. Godwin, Duncan, and General Blessington. So the story repeats itself, or at least repeats the same pattern, three times. Bella's curiosity leads her to one of these patriarchal oppressors. This man tries to own her, and she finally rebels and defeats this would-be tyrant. It occurred to me that these characters closely follow male Jungian archetypes. I remember this book that I read many years ago about four of these archetypes, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover by Robert Moore. However, there are two caveats that I must make here. First is that each of these archetypes have different embodiments that are both positive and negative. For example, the warrior can be either a hero or a war criminal. The second caveat is that these archetypes are far more complex than I can cover in this essay. So if you're interested, I can only point you to Carl Jung or to Robert Moore. Godwin maps quite well with the archetype of the king who is a fatherly figure that commands authority. In the film, he tries to protect Bella from the outside world by imprisoning her, as many overbearing parents do. Duncan is the embodiment of the lover, a sensual bon vivant, who initially has great success at seducing Bella, but as time drags on, he loses her attention and becomes poisoned with jealousy. Both Max and Harry embody different aspects of the archetype of the wizard, a person who lives very much inside their own head, and in more plain language we can also call the archetype of the nerd. Max is a weak-willed nerd who, despite being a brilliant surgeon, has little to no self-confidence and spends the whole movie serving the wishes of others, be that Godwin or later Bella. At last, we have the final boss represented by General Blessington, who fits in with the archetype of the warrior. He is a military man, and in the film he is portrayed as an aristocratic tyrant, without a single redeeming quality, who represents the cruel old patriarchy. Notice that almost all male characters are negative characters. They are antagonists in some way or another. The only exception to this is our dear Max. The only good male character is a literal cuck with no individual will beyond serving his owner, first Godwin and then Bella. This fact reinforces the idea that for a committed feminist, there is no such thing as good masculinity, except, of course, submissive masculinity. All other types of masculinity, from the lover to the warrior, are just different shades of toxic masculinity. This, however, makes more sense when you see feminism as female nationalism. The idea that women represent a separate group from men with their own identity and interest as opposed to men and their oppressive patriarchy. 
Indeed, all nationalisms have the same idea, that their enemies are only good when they are submissive. For example, to a Roman aristocrat, all genuine expressions of Germanic culture are barbarous and disgusting. For the Roman aristocrat, the only civilized barbarians are the slaves who are bringing him grapes. I believe that it is the same thing with feminism. The only good man is a submissive man. And I'm sure that many will dispute this, but so far I have not heard a single feminist definition of good masculinity that goes beyond subservience, the embrace of femininity, and of course being an obedient ally. If you're a feminist and believe that this is incorrect, I would be interesting in hearing the argument. Indeed, I believe that this is what is at the heart of this film. Poor Things is a Roman triumph where toxic masculinity is defeated and then paraded on screen to be first judged and then punished, in a similar way to how the Romans paraded their defeated enemies after a great victory. In modern media, the best example of this is the triumph of Caesar over the Gauls, as represented in HBO's Rome. Here, the defeated king of the Gauls, Vercingetorix, is dressed up in full regalia and chained to a pole where he is publicly strangled in front of victorious Caesar. In this figurative triumph, Bella is the conquering heroine with her laurel over her head. Behind her, the caricatures of each male archetype are dragged and chained in front of her and the cheering crowds. Each one of these characters is then punished. Godwin is shown to be overbearing and psychopathically cold, as well as creepy for trying to marry a literal child off to Max. However, he is partly redeemed as a character due to the fact that he gives up his protective stance towards Bella and lets Bella go off to get plowed by Duncan. The message is clear. A good father figure will let his daughter do whatever she wants and any attempt to protect his clearly immature daughter is patriarchal. Duncan, the lover, gets a much harsher treatment in this triumph. He is shown to be a pathetic and incompetent man. He is okay as long he, as he is Bella's personal fuckboy, but since he overreached and tried to possess her, he gets humiliated. After all, by the end of his character arc, he is disheveled and a petty idiot who ends up in a literal asylum. Finally, we have General Blessington, the warrior who represents the masculine capacity for violence. He is shown to be a patriarchal tyrant and therefore Bella's worst enemy. He is paraded in chains and given one last humiliation before being decerebrated and having his body live on as a goat. Of course, this triumph over the enemy was thoroughly celebrated in the cinema where I saw the film, but as a man, it just didn't sit well with me. Immediately after the film, I started arguing with my grandmother about the film and did the conservative trick of reversing the roles, which sometimes still works with boomers. I asked her what she would think of a movie where all the female characters are portrayed as bitches except the one which is a submissive housewife. She replied that she would kill the director. And although I wouldn't go as far as that, I would still be dishonest if I did not say that this movie's attack on masculinity did not leave a good impression on me. And I think that here we can discover something very interesting about all identity politics. The thing that most brings out the nationalism in people is the feeling of being attacked. And I think that a great example of this is the resurgence in Ukrainian patriotism and their Ukrainian language as a result of their war with Russia. It is also the case that the catalyst for German nationalism in the 19th century was the Napoleonic conquest of Germany. Indeed, the colors of the German flag came from the uniform of one of the militias that fought against Napoleon. So, I believe that the rise in what we could call male nationalists in the past couple of years is no coincidence. Male nationalism can be best described as an ideology that looks out for the interests and grievances of men as a group uh, in opposition to the enemy, women, thus being the other side of the feminist coin. Male nationalism is definitely on the rise and it can be a best attested by the popularity of dating coaches, the insult movement, and overall the propagation of a certain bitterness against women. I believe that this arms race between the genders, where men see women as a problem and vice versa, will continue to get much worse in the coming decades. 
I wouldn't think much of it if it was just any other sort of nationalism, because separation would resolve the problem. Greeks and Turks are not killing each other nowadays, because after their last war, they exchanged their populations and have not been massacring each other since. The issue is that we do not reproduce through mitosis, something that would definitely simplify things, but we are anything but a simple species. So, when there are high tensions between men and women and these two groups separate from each other, the result is that such a society has no children and eventually dies. So, in a certain sense, I believe that both of these movements are destructive and their goal is ultimately the castration of the other sex. Feminism wants to turn men into obedient weaklings and male nationalism wants to turn women into obedient housewives. In a healthy society, men and women should not attempt to castrate each other, but frankly, I do not see any ideologies that can provide a way to mend this mutual animosity. But that is a topic for another essay. But let's return to the story to explore the second theme. So, what do all of these characters of masculinity have in common? The answer is that they all committed the same crime to various degrees. They tried to control Bella's sexuality. Godwin tried to overprotect her, Duncan tried to make her his toy, and the general wanted to have a submissive housewife by literally castrating her. This reveals the second key point of the film and of modern feminism, namely that a woman's sexuality is the key to her freedom and that discovering this sexuality is the thing that leads to a woman towards maturity. This film, after all, is Bella's coming-of-age story and this process is tightly linked with her sexuality. Her sexuality, in a real sense, is the thing that drives the plot. Her sexual curiosity is the reason that she rebels against Godwin. Indeed, it, her personal development culminates with her working in a brothel where she loses the last shreds of her innocence and finally becomes a grown woman. The issue that I take with this, besides the glorification of prostitution, is that this movie equates the loss of innocence with maturity. Therefore, it makes narrative sense that Bella develops as an independent woman inside of a brothel. This is a message that is going to be very well received. After all, everybody likes sex, and achieving maturity through having fun sounds like, yeah, great, sounds great. But in my experience, this is not the case. I have known many people who have very varied and active sex lives, but I would not call them mature just because they are sexually experienced. Quite the opposite. Most of them are incredibly sad people who hide behind a layer of sex. In my memories, I distinctly remember one Irish girl that to the unsuspecting eye might seem like a jolly and liberated woman that enjoys sex and partying. But then, in an after party, I had a face-to-face -face conversation with her, and her eyes said it all. Then everything made sense. Her sexual mannerisms and escapades were a self-destructive defense mechanism to protect the sad little girl that was behind those captivating eyes. It was one of those late-night conversations where the human soul was laid bare, where everything seemed so clear. Before me was a girl with a broken heart. She told me that, in truth, what she wanted most was a loving relationship, and that she despised her habit of getting drunk and sleeping around, especially because this very same habit made it very difficult for her to have serious committed relationships. As I kept watching Poor Things for the first time, and it kept drumming on the message that through sexual escapades one grows as a person and becomes more mature, all I could think about was that hurt Irish girl and her sad little eyes. In a very real sense, she, like millions of other women, are the victims of this idea that through sex you can come of age. Without a doubt, sexual escapades can tear away a part of our childish innocence, but that just leaves a person that has lost it, her innocence but has not gained maturity. At least I do not think that maturity and the loss of innocence are the same thing. This, of course, depends on your personal definition of maturity, and this can only be anecdotal since everybody will try to relate this definition to their own experiences. 
in my own case, I believe that becoming mature is the process of knowing yourself and the world. There are no gimmicks to this. You cannot become more mature through reading books, through exploring your sexuality, or getting a degree. There are far more than enough immature nerds, libertines, and academics. Instead, the only way to maturity is having the bravery and honesty to confront the world and yourself as you are, not as you would like both of them to be. But this idea of maturity through sex is nothing new. In fact, it has predominated since the 70s, and Poor Things is no more than a reaffirmation of this old idea. However, old ideas have a special advantage. We can see their consequences in the real world. And I believe that the idea of discovering yourself and its consequences have been a disaster for young people. Of course, my opinion is the result of my life experiences. And being a 27 year old, I can confidently say that the women my age are, perhaps like never before, psychologically hurt. And a huge part of this is the very idea that they will develop as a person through a strange mix of non committal relationships and one night stands. Since I tend to be the ersat psychologist of my respective friend groups, I have had similar conversations to the first one with that Irish girl. And it is always the same feelings of loneliness and regret. Overall, I think that all of this comes from the fact that everybody wants to be loved. Everybody dreams of romance and of being special to someone. But that these wishes are subverted by our current hookup culture. And perhaps this is what pisses me off about this film. It furthers the exact ideas that I believe are hurting so many young people. Here we can also include the first theme of mutual hostility between the sexes. Men hating women and women hating men helps no one, but in part it is a result of the ideas that this film puts forward. We can also say that statistically there are fewer marriages and the birth rates are lower than ever before. Would it be far-fetched to say that maybe this is because the relationships between the genders are increasingly hostile and because we have divorced sex from commitment? Unlike my more anecdotal arguments, I think that we can establish a direct causality here. And one of the curious things about this film is that we can also see these two indicators, infertility and lovelessness, in the story. In the film, we see quite a lot of sex, but there is no accompanying pregnancy or children that would be expected from Victorian measures of birth control. With the exception of Bella's mother and a brief scene with the grandson of the madame, there is no pregnancy or children at all in this film. It is a film that could only be imagined by a world that has already become accustomed to the birth control pill. The same is the case with love. We see failed marriages, prostitution, sexual escapades, but no loving couples. So this story never really talks about love and the important role that it represents to a, in a young and innocent person trying to explore the world. The only instance of anything resembling romance that we see in the film is a single scene between Toinette and Bella, and not even this is developed further. So we arrive at the central question of this essay. What is the goal of the relationship between men and women? At the risk of sounding tacky, I will say that that goal is love. And by this, I do not mean the diluted hippie idea of love that is so meaninglessness and hollow that it can be applied to pretty much anything. When I say love, I mean the strongest bond that there can exist between two people. Luckily, it is very easy to know if you love someone. All that you need to ask yourself is if you're willing to die for this person. If the answer is yes, good for you. If the answer is no, then I have news for you. You like this person, but you do not love them. As previously stated, I truly believe that everyone wants to be loved and wants to love. But of course, it is not something that can be done lightly, since love demands absolute commitment, and that is exactly what the two central ideas of poor things undermine. Hostility between the sexes has created an environment of suspicion that breeds bitterness about each side's misgivings. 
this combined with the way that we have made sex into a transactional recreational activity, completely detached from love, has led to a terrible state of affairs in the love lives of most people. Frankly, after experiencing these things in my own life, I can confidently say that I fucking hate them. I hate the way that both immature men and women blame the other half of society for their problems, and I hate the sterile and utilitarian way that we think about sex. And you know what I want? I want passion, I want drama, I want commitment. I want to say to someone that I would die for them, and I want them to say the same thing for me. In short, what I want is the triumphant return of romanticism. I am convinced that an almost total lack of romanticism is the true problem behind low marriage and fertility rates. I also have reason to believe that this idea of bringing romanticism back would be very popular with young people who are beyond fed up of the our detached way of engaging in relationships. But I believe that this begins with taking the concept of love seriously, actually giving the word the power that it should have. When we bind love with sacrifice for a person that is special to you, we are forced to realize that this requires loyalty. Can you be loyal to a person that hates your gender? Can there be any loyalty between two people when they are not special to each other, for example, in a one night stand? Therefore, when a person desires love like we all do, they must face the fact that their pursuit of love is incompatible with all that is casual and easy because after all, love demands sacrifice. So, when you take the idea of love seriously, you will inevitably have to choose between painful love and detached fun. This is the decision that separates the utilitarians from the romantics. I believe that only a return to romanticism and away from sexual utilitarianism is the only way to mend the increasing bitterness between men and women and the general lovelessness that I see around me. But until then, we will just have to live on in what has to be the least romantic age that has ever existed. I think that that summarizes my feelings about this movie. It is incredibly well made, it is visually beautiful, and its performances are great. And yet I hate this movie because of its message, its thinly veiled attack on masculinity, and its loveless concept of sex that will lead hundreds of thousands a little further away from a romantic love. And yet, it will be showered with Oscars, because it perfectly reflects our current culture. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your time. If you want to do some further reading, I recommend this essay by Zinnia which um, covers similar topics from the point of view of a Zoomer girl. And I would also recommend, if you're interested in, whole, in the whole idea of archetypes, of actually reading Carl Jung, or if not, Doug, um, Douglas Murray. No, fuck, fuck, not Douglas Murray. Um, what's the name of the fucking... Uh, what's the name of the... Robert Moore. Robert Moore. Why did I say Douglas Murray? God help me. All right. Thank you for your time.